Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Andy. I'm an alcoholic. Hi. Hello. I am uh, really glad to be here. Um, my sobriety date is September 15th, 2002. My home group is the North Seattle group. We have two meetings, Sunday night speakers. Might have been there before, Sunday night, 6.30 p.m., the Northwest Christian Church. And uh, Wednesday night, a meeting called 50-50. Uh, it's uh, Greenwood Christian Church, 81st in Fremont. Um, so kind of sister meetings there. My sponsor is... Uh, Vinny I. I think he's in line for the restroom right now. Um, I also don't think he's taking complaints. If um, you want to talk to him after I'm done talking, he's probably not, not going to still take any complaints about anything I said. So, um, yeah, this is my home district. Uh, so it's kind of cool just to look around, and I know a lot of the people out there. And, uh, I, yeah, hey, Rick, how you doing? <laughs> And uh, that also is a little bit uh, nerve-wracking because it means people know me well enough that I can't really lie, uh, kind of like Kayla was talking about. But I'm really just honored to have an opportunity and be invited to participate um, in sobriety. Before I got sober, I was not really invited to participate in things very often. Uh, And the things I did participate in, usually at some point they would say, Andy, if you want to continue participating in this, you're going to have to agree to some conditions. Uh, and there were always things like, um, be here on time, don't drink, don't violate our code of conduct, stuff like that. It seems totally unreasonable to me. But um, uh, let's see. Uh, you know, I'm not from here. I grew up uh, in the Midwest. I'm from Indiana. If you ever seen the movie Hoosiers or listened to a John Mellencamp song, it's still pretty much like that. Um, my hometown was uh, not a small town, really, I mean, but a lot smaller than Seattle area, but it was factories and universities. Uh, if you drive a Subaru, out, uh, Subaru Outback, it was uh, assembled in my hometown, um, but we also had a university there. But um, for whatever reason, um, with all, you know, all the different kinds of people there, I still just somehow never fit in. Um, you know, from the beginning, uh, I was, um, you know, one of the nerdy kids. If you've ever seen uh, the television show... Stranger Things, uh, you know, the kids hanging out in the basement, that was me, um, except without the courage to fight evil. Uh, we didn't do any of that. But, um, you know, Dungeons and Dragons, Weird Al, marching band, I did all of that stuff. Um, and I was thinking about it the other day, my three best friends, um, one of them, his dad was a, a physician at one of the factories. Another one, his dad wrote computer programs for a different factory. And the third one, his dad ran the libraries. My dad was a PhD chemist, so we were multi-generational nerds. We were like nerds all the way through. Um, That did not stop me, at least, from from drinking, but I'll get to that. Uh, So um, that feeling like I don't fit in, I don't belong, um, I'm not a part of whatever's going on here, there's something wrong with me, I don't remember ever not having that feeling. Uh, I don't know why. Um, but I always have uh, always felt that way. And I remember being in kindergarten, and it was one of the first times um, we had this assignment in kindergarten where they laid out this long sheet of paper, and we were supposed to draw some kind of mural on it or something, and the teacher was really super clear. I mean, I, still, I was five. I still remember this. Um, she said, do not try to jump across this piece of paper. You will not make it. Um, my mind heard, if I make it across this piece of paper, Jenny Seeger will like me. Uh, and I really wanted people to like me. Um, I don't know why, um, but I felt like I needed someone else to say that I was okay. So uh, I tried to jump across a piece of paper, and I landed right in the middle and tore it right in half. Uh, and the teacher made me go put my head down, and I cried for, it felt like, three days. It was probably like <laughs> ten minutes. Um, but, uh, you know, and so it, it, that awkward moment felt like 24-7. I felt that all the time. Um, you know, fast forward, you know, in elementary school, they said, uh, hey, Andy, we think uh, you could benefit from going to see the school counselor. Uh, and I was like, okay, finally, people are noticing that I'm weird. Um, time to go see the school counselor. Uh, that started a long uh, kind of 
stretch of me seeing different counselors, psychologists, psychiatrists, all that stuff. Uh, I don't do any of that stuff today. Uh, I haven't needed to since I've been in AA, but that's just my, my experience with it. But, um, uh, you know, so at some point, um, you know, uh, they gave me some prescription medication, um, and one of them was Xanax. Uh, and I discovered that that worked a little better if I did not take it as prescribed. <laughs> um, uh, however, I will say that, you know, when I was really started doing that, I didn't do it that much. I only did it a couple times. Um, and it seemed to kind of take the edge off, or at least it slowed things down enough that I didn't feel like I was under attack all the time by my own mind. Um, but, you know, the, the times that I really took it, uh, a couple of them were before basketball games. I played uh, sousaphone in the basketball game at, for the pep band. That's like the tuba thing that you wear. Um, and sousaphone and Xanax do not mix. <laughs> Don't do that. Uh, don't do that at all. But, um, but you know, so that, that's, those are kind of the only kind of non-alcohol stuff I ever did um, uh, for the most part. Although I really do believe that, you know, as far as that goes, alcoholics should not do drugs. It's a bad idea. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I didn't really get started drinking until after I was done with high school. So I graduated from high school when I was 17 um, and... Uh, we, my family had hosted exchange students growing up, so I knew people uh, all over Europe and one in Japan and, and stuff that had lived with my family. I mean, these were like my brothers and sisters. And uh, so a couple of them were from Denmark, and I went to stay with their family in Denmark when I graduated from high school. So I had like a year between high school and college where I was young enough that I could still go do that and go to Danish high school, basically. And what happened to me was uh, I flew out there. Um, when you get there, they put you in a two-week like intensive language camp. Even though everyone speaks English in Denmark, uh, they told everyone at school, don't speak English to him. He needs to learn Danish and stuff. So they really wanted us to learn Danish, uh, which, was, which was good. But um, uh, I really liked the, uh, the two-week camp, went through that, then went and stayed with uh, the host family I was staying with. First night I was there. Uh, one of their sons was my age, um, and him and his best friend took me out to the bar because they were like, all right, welcome to Denmark. American kid in Denmark, um, you know, what we do when we're 17, 18 here is we go to the bar. It's something you can do here, so let's try it out. Uh, and they bought me um, beer. I drank nine Two Boar Green beers. Um, some, for some reason, I remember the number really well. Uh, and then they ran out of money. Um, but... Uh, that was the first time that I ever got drunk. It wasn't the first time I ever drank. I mean, I drank some pretty heavy stuff, you know, like Bartles and James Wine Cooler um, <laughs> at my parents' house before I remember chugging one of those in the basement trying to feel something. Uh, just kind of felt warm and fruity. Um, but I got drunk in that bar, and it unlocked something inside my mind that I had been looking for my whole life and not known it. Um, I, I, you know, I can't explain it other than it's like, um, the way that I think about it, I've described it before as feeling like I was a philosopher cowboy, uh, you know, 10 feet tall, bulletproof, uh, for the first time ever, I'm, you know, tough, good looking, uh, but I'm also, you know, ready to write the best poetry in the world. And, um, it gave me enough courage to go up and all of a sudden, you know, I knew about 10 words in Danish, so I said all 10 of those to the other girls at the bar who were a lot older than me, um, and they laughed, um, you know, and, and I just, I loved it. I felt like um, that thinking, just that, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What, that was always in my mind. The thing that I had when I first tried to make it go away when um, jumping across that piece of paper was gone. Uh, I just felt relaxed. I felt in control. I felt like, um, you know, I can do this. And I think what, uh, maybe it's the 12 and 12. One of the books describes it as um, alcohol allowed us to act extemporaneously. Uh, yeah. that, that's how I felt. Um, and, uh, you know, so uh, I, some people in their story, you know, they start drinking at 12 and they say, well, it's hard to be drunk all the time at age 12. If you live uh, in Denmark and you're 18, because I turned 18 kind of right when I got there, you can drink whenever you want. Um, that's what I did. Um, the next day, I pretty much went to Danish Walmart and bought a 30-pack of beer and just kept it in my closet, uh, the house that I was staying in, and drank those. Um, you know, and in short order, I was a blackout drinker. Um, I remember, um, you know, just kind of uh, 
almost every time I drank from that point forward, um, I would black out unless, uh, you know, something would happen that would keep me from being able to drink as much as I wanted to. Um, and then, uh, you know, I came back early from that exchange student trip because I was depressed. Uh, go figure. And I um, uh, started going to college and, you know, wasn't doing so well in college, was on academic probation after a couple of uh, semesters. And, you know, I, I had a hard time holding it together. I mean, I always just barely held it together on paper, uh, you know, w w when I was drinking. Somehow I weaseled my way out of ever being held accountable for anything. Um, you know, and a lot of it was like, hey, you're going to fail this class. Oh, here's a doctor's note that says I'm depressed. You need to give me an incomplete, um, you know, stuff like that. Um, but, you know, I'll tell a couple of stories that, you know, help explain a little bit how, how I drink. One of them was when I was in college one summer, I worked at a shoe store. And I kept a bottle of wild turkey in one of the shoe boxes in the back. Because, you know, when you work at a shoe store, you go and customer says, I want to try this shoe. Great. You go into the back to get it, drink some wild turkey, bring the shoes out, come back up front. So after a couple of hours, uh, I was in there and a woman came in and she said, yeah, I'd like to get some shoes. Can you measure my foot? I was like, sure. Um, you know, so I went to measure her foot and I'm trying to measure it and I like, can't get it. And I'm just like, her foot doesn't even fit on the thing. And I'm like, I just look at her and I say, I don't know if we have any shoes for you because you have the biggest feet I've ever seen. <laughs> and she goes, I want to talk to a manager. Um, she didn't like that. So the manager came over and he helped her out and then he came up to me afterwards and he's like, go home, that you're trying to measure her foot with the children's scale. <laughs> yeah. So dumb stuff, you know? And it's, it's funny, but then it, it's not so funny that, you know, I was drunk. I drove home. Uh, you know, I stay, I, when I got home, I drank more uh, until I was throwing up all over the place in my apartment. Uh, which I did every night. I, I like to drink by myself mostly, but I will go. I will go out with other people if I can drink first and leave early enough to go home and drink the rest. Um, in college, they didn't like it because they'd say, "Hey, let's go out to the bar," and I'm like, "Nope, I'm watching cartoons this Friday. You can come over if you want." Uh, we drink and watch cartoons. But uh, another story that I remember: um, one of my friends in college invited me to go to. Uh, I was going to go home with him for spring break or something like that. He's like, well, I have to go to this wedding, but um, I, you can probably crash it. He goes, because it's going to be huge. There's like five or 600 people there. It is, um, you know, I think his family was the groom, and then the other family was the bride. And his family was Irish. They were Italian, all Catholic. Um, and uh, But he's like, but you got to be a little bit careful because... The bride is the daughter of a mob boss in the area. I was like, okay. Um, you can, yeah, some, some of you can already tell where this is going. Um, but so we get there, and, uh, you know, we're like, okay, we're just going to take it easy. We're have some beer. We're drinking fat tire. But his uncle comes up uh, while we're ordering a couple fat tires, walks over to the bartender and, and goes, these guys are on my tab, slides a credit card over to her. He goes, drink, let them drink whatever they want, and walks away. And I look at my friend, and I look back at the bartender, and I'm like, go get the 21-year-old single barrel from the back. We're drinking scotch, right? The next thing I remember uh, was two guys that looked like they were straight off of Goodfellas holding me up in front of this other guy that looks kind of like Vinny. And <laughs> he just looks at me, and he says, who are you here with? Because you're leaving. Um, you know, and then uh, ne next thing I remember after that was coming to in a place I didn't know where I was. Uh, I couldn't move my right arm. There was blood all over me. No idea what happened. Um, I was uh, happened to be in kind of like my friend's cousin's house. Somehow we wound up there. Um, but, you know, we just drove home the next day, and that was it. And, like, nothing else happened from that. But, um, uh but, you know, that kind of stuff kept happening. And I was like, why does this keep happening? Um, you know, and I, I would have these periods of time where I'd say, I, I, gotta, I can't do this anymore. I got to stop. Uh, I got to stop, uh, you know, getting into these problems. Um, and, you know, so I would try to just not drink for a while. I was like, I can't, I can't you know, get drunk like this. 
Um, and then, uh, you know, I'd make it a few days, maybe a week. And then I would have this thought that would just be like, man, I'm just, I'm so stressed out. Uh, I need something to take the edge off. I just need to relax a little bit. Um, you know, you know, maybe I'll just have a couple drinks to just relax. Uh, cause that'll make me feel better. Um, but then I would have a couple drinks would turn into, you know, that wedding all over again every time. Uh, I had no ability to control my drinking. I never knew what was going to happen. If I had one, all of a sudden I'd be blackout drunk. Um, and, uh, you know, it didn't occur to me that I wouldn't be able to drink safely until I got here. But, uh, so when I hit bottom, what was happening was I was in, I'd somehow held things together just enough that I made it to grad school. Uh, and I was in graduate school, and uh, I was failing out of graduate school. They they hold a pretty high bar there um, for what you're supposed to be, do. You know, they want you to go to class, pay attention. Um, a lot of the classes start at eight o'clock in the morning. It's really hard. Um, you know, so they're like, yeah, you, you know, you're on academic probation again. You know, you you just barely got off it last time, and now you're on again. So you got a few weeks to ship up or shape or shape up or ship out, and. Um, yeah, you know, so finally I was still seeing the psychiatrist and stuff. I went to the psychiatrist one time and I said, uh, I can't stop drinking. And he goes, really? I go, yeah. He goes, well, you're not supposed to drink when you're on these medicines. I go, yeah, but I mean, I can't stop. Uh, and he goes, okay. He goes, well, have you ever tried to stop before? I was like, yeah, um, I did stop before. I was on interviews for a while. Um, you know, yeah. So, I mean, I'd kind of been through this before, but, um, uh, I stopped taking the interviews because, I, in my mind, I was like, I, st <laughs> I stopped taking interviews because I wanted to use aftershave. And I thought <laughs> I wouldn't be able to do that because it has alcohol in it while I was taking interviews. <laughs> really, I just wanted to drink. But, um, <laughs> by the way, you know, doctors that prescribe antibuse, I mean, I don't blame them, but like, you, if you prescribe that to somebody, you really don't understand what alcoholism is because that's not going to fix it. Um, but, uh, you know, so I told him this stuff and he's like, well, have you ever considered going to treatment? And I said, no. Nope. And he goes, well, you can go to this treatment center and, uh, you know, you go in there for however long the program was. Um, and he goes, you know, you go in do some kind of assessment or something and then they'll, they'll have you in there. And then, and, you know, that's treatment for alcoholism to help you get started not drinking anymore. And I said, okay, uh, sounds good. Uh, and I went to treatment at Highland Park Hospital in Highland Park, Illinois, just north of Chicago. And um, I loved it there because it was like being on vacation. There are no bills when you're in treatment. Um, there's no life responsibilities. Uh, you know, don't have to go to class, don't have to go to work, nothing. I just get to be in there and, um, you know, repeat back all the stuff they tell me like I've known it for years. Uh, and then, you know, the counselors tell me I'm an old soul and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and just, you know, try to feel good about myself. Um, but, you know, my idea of what treatment would be was that I would go there, I would, you know, get a break from alcohol, and then suddenly be able to never drink again. Um, while I was there, they said, you got to go to one AA meeting to get out of here. Um, and I was like, okay. So I said, oh, I better go to one AA meeting, even though it was outpatient treatment that I drove myself to every day. I could leave whenever I wanted. But, um, uh, so I went to one AA meeting, and it was in a church basement. It seemed darker than this. Everybody there seemed like an older guy, much older than me, um, wearing a flannel shirt with a big beard. Uh, they were all super nice. Um, and I thought, man, this stuff seems like a really good thing for them. I'm glad that, you know, they have this. Um, pe you know, pe some people need this kind of stuff. Uh, ne never even thought that I, I might you know, listen to what they had to say or anything. I wasn't even thinking about listening to it because I was thinking, like, I got this. I've lived my entire life never asking for help from anyone on anything. If I don't know the answer, I'm not going to ask the professor or the teacher. I'm going to go look it up. Uh, if you talk about something that I know nothing about, I'm going to stand there and pretend like I know what you're talking about. Uh, and then if I think you might catch me, I'm going to go figure it out later behind the scenes. So it sounds like I did know what I was talking about. You know, so um, my plan was just never drink again. Uh, I got out of that treatment center, uh, went back, uh, and, you know, within a week I drank again. Needed to take the edge off. Something bad happened. Uh, it all happened all over again. So I called somebody that was a professor in the school that I was in at the time um, because I thought having a really strong relationship with him would help me get a job when I get out. Uh, you know, sometimes bad motives help us. 
But, um, you know, so, but he was in, he was sober in NAA. And so I called him and he's like, yeah, come, you know, come on, let's go to some meetings. And he say, I go to a meeting with him. He's like, let's go to a meeting tomorrow. I'm like, you know, I feel good now. I think I'm going to be okay. <laughs> you know, and a week would go by, same thing all over again. You know, so I did that a few times until um, eventually um, I was able to kind of buckle down a little bit. I went to an AA meeting every now and then. Um, you know, when I was trying that, guys would say, hey, come to our home group. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, okay. Uh, and then in my mind, I'm like, I'm not going to somebody's house that's, you know, <laughs> meeting by invitation only to your house. No, thanks. Because that's what I thought a home group was. Uh, no idea what it was. Um, you know, and uh, um, I, I kind of managed to buckle down enough where I, I held it together a little bit, long enough that I got married. Because I thought, <laughs> this is going to be a good way to stay sober. You know, here's somebody that can hold me accountable. You know, uh, you know, somebody that, you know, in the house all the time, I'm not going to drink in front of her. This is, that was not a good foundation for a relationship, <laughs> just uh, in case you were wondering. That relationship did not last. Um, that marriage did not last. But, um, uh, you know, so I got married. And then four months later, uh, we were in marriage counseling. And uh, I happened to mention to the marriage counselor, uh, oh, yeah, I'm an alcoholic. I don't drink anymore. She's like, oh, do you go to uh, AA or anything like that? I go, nope, no, I went to a few of those meetings, but I don't really go now. I mean, um, you know, it's not something that I probably need to do. And she just said, okay, well, if you ever feel like you want to go again, you know, there's a meeting this Saturday, actually, that this was Thursday when she said this, Saturday morning, if you wanted to go. Uh, and a couple things I didn't know at that moment. One, I didn't know that she was an al -Anon. Uh Two, uh, I didn't know that I was going to be desperate enough to actually do something different. Because by this point, I was homicidal and suicidal every day. Um, uh, one of the stories I tell all the time was just living on the west side of Chicago. Not west side, West Loop. It's a big difference if you're from Chicago. <laughs> west side is like the drug land and West Loop is, you know, yuppies. Um, so I was living in the West Loop, and uh, I worked on Michigan Avenue, so I would walk along uh, the Chicago River and Wacker Drive to get to work every day. And I mean, I was, if, if you've ever seen the movie Falling Down um, with Michael Douglas, where he's got the baseball bat and the briefcase, and he's just out of his mind, that was pretty much what I looked like every day. Um, you know, I would play chicken on the sidewalk with people that didn't know I was playing chicken with them. Uh, and, you know, just think about throwing people off the bridge and just out of my mind. Because I had untreated alcoholism. I did not know that. I just thought I was nuts. But um, I was nuts enough to go to the meeting that she suggested. So I went to a meeting uh, at the YMCA on Dearborn and Chicago uh, Avenue in Chicago on Saturday morning. And uh, they said, uh, hey, is there anybody new uh, to AA? And I kind of felt like um, that was a good time to stand up and say, I'm not new, but I haven't been to a meeting in a while. Uh, and uh, so, you know, uh, maybe I'll talk to somebody afterwards. And uh, some guy came up to me and he's like, hey, um, what's going on? Are you been going to meetings and stuff? I go, no, not really. This is the first one I've been to in a long time. And he goes, well, there's a ton of meetings in this area. Let me get you a directory. He went and looked around. We don't have any directories. Here, give me your coffee cup. Uh, and he wrote, you know, Sunday through Saturday, meeting every day of the week on that coffee cup and handed it back to me. Uh, and, you know, I didn't even think to look it up online. I mean, it was 2002. So um, actually, I think by this time it was 2003. But, um, you know, I went and that was my directory. This is like coffee cup that I kept on my kitchen counter. And uh, so I went to the meeting the next day, and he wasn't there. Um, I got my first AA resentment, because I thought he was going to be at all these meetings. Otherwise, he wouldn't invite me there, because I didn't want to go if he wasn't going to be there. I don't know anybody. Um, but, uh, you know, so I, I started going to meetings. And, uh, but, you know, that gave me a little bit of relief. But I didn't get a sponsor. I didn't do anything else. After a few months, I was just going nuts again, but I was still going to meetings. And I was trying really hard in meetings. I would talk about, you know, all the prayer I was doing, um, you know, had a, how I had this direct connection with God and how I could hear the birds now. Because that's what I thought people were said in meetings. I mean, I really didn't know what was going on. Um, <laughs> luckily, I was in one meeting, and uh, there was a group of people that came to the meeting. And one guy was talking, and he shared, and a whole bunch of his home group members came with him. Uh, and, you know, for the first time ever, somehow just like honesty came out of my mouth during the sharing period. And I said, 
My brain feels like a giant glass jar with one marble in it that's stuck in the paint shaker. And these guys all laughed. And I laughed. I hadn't laughed in a long time, you know? And uh, it felt good, you know? And they came up and talked to me afterwards. They're like, yeah, we know exactly what you're talking about. That's called untreated alcoholism. And I was like, okay. I didn't know what they were talking about, but I was so desperate it didn't matter. Um, and they said, why don't you come to our home group? It's at this building. And I was surprised. Um, didn't sound like it was an apartment building, but I was like, yeah, okay, I'll come. You know, at this point, I'm just ready to go. So I tried to go to the home group the next uh, week. They said, you know where it is? I'm like, yep, no idea. I'm going to look it up. Uh, I looked it up, but I still didn't really figure it out because what happened was I'm standing there trying to go to the home group. I'm, saying, I'm right next to it. It's at the Seward Park District House in Chicago, right across from Cabrini Green. But uh, that's not a home, so it must not be where the home group is. There's some apartments across the street. So I wait for the light, it changes, I start crossing the street, bam, I get hit by a car. <laughs> and like, I remember, like as I feel my skull bouncing on the ground, I was like, maybe I should have asked where the meeting was. <laughs> you <know>? And uh, <laughs> You know, so I called the guy that I, I actually took some numbers and I called him. I was like, hey, I got hit by a car, so I can't come to this meeting. He's like, holy cow, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I think I'm fine, but I can't come to the meeting. He's like, okay, well, don't worry about it. Just come next week. Do you know where it is? No. Can you tell me where it is? <laughs> you know, so he told me where it was and I went. That was, uh, that was my home group for uh, the next nine years um, that I lived in Chicago. I got a sponsor there. I started working the steps and started actually doing something. Uh, and it totally changed my life. Um, you know, I uh, was willing to do whatever they said. They said, hey, we're going to the restaurant after the meeting. You want to come? Yes. Uh, hey, we're going to the 6 a.m. meeting tomorrow. You want to come? Yes. Uh, I had every service position there was to have uh, in that group. Um, I remember, you know, having my sponsor and thinking, Mike, um, I don't know. You know, he's like, Are you, how's the four step going? I was like, I don't know if I'm ready for the four step. Um, actually, I think Mike was my grand sponsor at this time. I go, I don't know if I'm ready for the fourth step. And he goes, okay, well, let's talk about that. He goes, so uh, first step, he goes, why do you keep coming here? Um, did, you, do you uh, stop drinking? Do you think you're an alcoholic? I'm like, yeah, I'm definitely an alcoholic. I can't do that drinking thing anymore. He's like, okay, why do you keep coming to the meetings? Um, said, well, because I think that you know, they just seem to help. He goes, so you think that there's something here that can help you that's more than what you're doing by yourself? I'm like, yep. He's like, okay. Do you want to finish the rest of the steps? you want to go through the rest of the steps? Uh, I go, yep. He goes, one, two, three, you're done. Start your fourth step. I was like, <laughs> okay. You know, so I started my fourth step. And uh, uh, unlike Kayla, although I was encouraged to do it in a week, I did it in several months. Um, it was actually several months and then eight hours because that's how long it actually took me to write it. Um, but uh, so I don't recommend waiting at all. I really feel really lucky that I even got to stay sober. But, uh, you know, and uh, th things really started to, to shift around for me. Um, I got freedom from alcohol. Uh, I started to have freedom from my frame of mind. Um, you know, I remember when I was still drinking, I, uh, at one point, I ordered this soap that I saw from a catalog. It was called Wash Your Sins Away. <laughs> right? And it was a joke. I get the joke. You know, it's funny. Um, but the really sad part was like, I, I kind of hoped that it would work somehow, <laughs> even though how ridiculous it was. That's just, you know, that's how desperate I was for something to be different. Uh, it wasn't until I got into AA and they're like, uh, yeah, drinking's just a symptom. It's a spiritual malady. You got to do something about that causes and conditions. It's called living AA as a way of life. Sponsor home group, work the steps, sponsor other people. That's what we do. And, um, I wanted to talk about old ideas a little bit. I remember... Uh, my sponsors over the years have helped me a lot with old ideas that I've had. Uh, one time I was talking to my sponsor, Mike, who was a collegiate wrestler. Uh, he was a uh, state champion wrestler in high school. Uh, and uh, another guy in my home group was a personal trainer. Uh, and um, they like to get together, you know, guys from the home group and watch uh, UFC, watch a whole bunch of stuff that I never watched before. I'm the Dungeons and Dragons kid. Uh, you know, and I'm sitting there watching it and I just kind of like, okay, I'm trying to fit in. And I remember one time telling Mike, I was like, Mike, you know, I just, sometimes I feel really awkward around this kind of stuff because I just, you know, I don't know how to interact with certain people. Uh, you know, my, the jocks were the kids that picked on me in school. And, you know, so now I'm trying to hang out with you guys, but I don't really know how to do it. And I'm out of my element and it's really awkward. Um, and he's like, okay. And 
what I thought he would say or what I wanted him to say was, <clears throat> don't worry about that, Andy. Everybody has their talents. You're okay. If sports isn't yours, don't worry about it. He goes, you don't have to be, you know, a jock or, or you know, physical stuff or anything like that to fit in with us. We can tone it down a little bit. Maybe we'll play Dungeons and Dragons sometime. That's what I wanted him to say. That's not what he said. What he said was he looked at me in the eyes and he said, well, what are you going to do about that? Uh, and I go, what do you mean? He's like, maybe it's time to hit the gym. And, uh, you know, so that started a path of, you know, learning what my old ideas about myself were. Not everybody has the same old ideas, but one of mine happened to be who I thought I was um, and, and what it meant to me. And, and, you know, just kind of being that nerdy kid who's not, you know, who's not a sports guy, doesn't go to the gym, all that kind of stuff. Um, that played a, a outsized role in my life and the ideas that I had about me and the decisions I made and, you know, how I presented and separated me from other people because I had that separation with myself. You know, I remember being at the high school dances and watching all the popular, you know, football players and stuff out dancing with the girls and standing on the side with all the other nerds going, wow, oh, man, look at those guys. What a bunch of jerks. And I do remember one time my friend was like, you mean all the guys out there dancing with girls and having fun? Maybe we should try that. Like, You're fired. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so you know, uh, I started going to the gym and doing all that stuff. You know, the I think another part in our literature says, oh, when the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. Um, and that happened to me. I remember uh, I have a sponsor brother who plays hockey, and I was talking to Vinny one day, and he's like, how come you don't play hockey? You've been a lifelong fan. I love ice hockey. It's an outside issue. If you don't love it, it's okay. Um, but uh, he's like, maybe you should play. Uh, you know, and so I took a learn to play class um, and started playing ice hockey, joined an ice hockey team. This was just like two years ago. And, um, you know, it was just, it was a huge new idea because to me, I was like, I don't do team sports. I've, I, you know, the last five years I've gotten the best shape of my life, but I don't do team sports. And, uh, you know, so I got to try that and man, the number of old ideas and the things about that come up in my mind, um, it was not very long before I was leading our team in penalty minutes. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I'm, like the idea I have about myself is, oh, hey, I'm a little meek and mild, no, no confrontation, no thanks. All of a sudden, uh, yeah, I like confrontation. You know? I like it a lot. And I play defense, and uh, I like that a lot, you know. But, um, uh, but anyway, you know, so... Uh, when I hit 10 years sober, um, I had an opportunity to um, have a chance to move out to Seattle. Uh, and I was absolutely terrified of that prospect. Uh, it seemed like a, a really good idea on paper for everything, except, you know, I've been in the same home group my whole sobriety here. What's going to happen? Um, you know, I remember my sponsor there, he said, well, I think they have AA meetings in Seattle. Uh, and he was right. And uh, he gave me one really, really good piece of advice, though. He's like, you're not going to have 10-year relationships the first week you're there. So it's going to take some work. Just stick with it, um, which has been the case for me. Now I feel like I've had some years-long relationships with some people in this room, and that's it's been really great. But, um, but you know, so I came out here to, to interview, and while I was here interviewing, I went to an AA meeting. Uh, just so happened that I went to that meeting, and uh, there were... Um, some uh, people there that were from Sunday Night Speakers. One of the guys from Sunday Night Speakers was speaking, chairing that meeting. It was the Tuesday night uh, recovery cafe meeting. I don't know if anybody knows that meeting. Um, but, uh, and a whole bunch of uh, his sponsees and other people came with him and they were talking about the same solution that I heard back in Chicago. They were talking about the Halloween party they were gonna have uh, and how excited they were about stuff. And I was like, these guys sound a little bit like the guys that I'm hanging out with in Chicago. Maybe I can move here. So I went up afterwards, I said, hey, can I get your phone numbers? And I uh, started talking to them. Sunday Night Speakers was my home group before I landed here uh, with a one-way ticket back in 2012. Uh, and it's been my home group ever since. Um, and I also know our Seattle group because we got the second meeting. But, uh, you know, that took a lot of effort just trying to get involved and, and be on top of that stuff. Um, but, you know, for me, there's no such thing as just kind of, that would have been an easy time to just kind of fade away or all of a sudden be like, hey, you know what? I'm, I want to be career-oriented. It's time to get some balance in my life and go after you know some of the other things, cash and prizes, that I really want that I think is going to make me happy. Uh, I think one of the worst things that can happen to an alcoholic, at least it's happened to me, is the thing that I think is going to make me happy that I get that. 
because uh, that's happened to me more than once, um, and it's made me really happy for about two or three days. Uh, and then I realize everything is still there. Um, you know, and the thing that continues to take it away on a daily basis is actually showing up to events like this. By the way, welcome to anyone who's new. I don't know if there's anybody new here tonight, but um, yeah, if you are new and you're at the District Gratitude Banquet, you got, I think you got a shot. Um, I mean, like, I remember they told me when I was new, they're like, you know, stick with the winners. And what they meant was, you know, the people who were going to meetings, sponsoring people, had a sponsor, working the steps, basically the people who were excited about being sober, uh, not just miserable about being sober. And, um, you know, this room is, I think, filled with those people tonight. Um, but, uh, you know, um, getting a chance to be a part of all of the stuff, um, was with Seattle AA has been uh, a really helpful. You know, I've had, uh, you know, those just a different way of life that's allowed me to, like I said, you know, you can get all the great things that I wanted. I've gotten some of the things I didn't want. You know, bad things have happened too. Uh, I got divorced in sobriety, and that wasn't really bad. It just kind of was, um, which was strange. I got a great relationship with my ex-wife. We're great co-parents. Um, but, uh you just, you know, you will find me uh, almost always at Sunday, at Wednesday. I go to a meeting uh, Tuesdays. Um, you know, I, I go, you know, five days a week on and off. It depends because I have my kids um, every other week. But um, that and, and then doing that, I hit, hit my knees in the morning and I say, God, please help me stay sober and do your will today. And that's pretty much it. And then I do some readings, read page 86, some of that kind of stuff. Other people probably do that too. I hit my knees at night. I go to those meetings, like I mentioned. I meet with the guys that I sponsor. I meet with my sponsor uh, once a week. I've got service positions. My service position right now is I'm the event coordinator for the North Seattle group. It's a great position. Um, I have been GSR there. I've also um, been on the committee for Seattle Fall Conference, if you've attended that. But um, uh, all of that kind of stuff, when I'm doing all of that, all the rest of the parts of my life just kind of just float on. I, you know, they've, I, w I was going to say fall into place, but that makes it sound like I want them to go a certain way. Um, and that's not the case. Like, it doesn't even matter how they go. Um, it, and, you know, I just, I'm able to keep going every day and be happy about staying sober. Uh, and when bad things happen, they don't take me out. When good things happen, I don't leave. Um, you know, so if you're new and you're, you're looking for a solution to the same kind of thing I was, uh, I found it here. Keep coming back. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.